Hello and welcome to this video on implementing and using visual supports. I'm Elaine and I'm Gillian and we are speech and language therapists with the Brothers of Charity Services Southern Region. We work as part of the South Lee Autism Team with children and adolescents with a diagnosis of autism. We have seen firsthand the positive impacts that visual supports can have in the clinic, school and home environments. We want to put lots of the information that you might need in one place to increase the confidence of families and clinicians in implementing visuals in different environments. This presentation is designed to be used in a few ways. If you want a detailed overview of why we use visuals, the different type of visual supports that we can use and how to implement them, you can watch this presentation video all the way through. Alternatively, if you are looking for information on a specific type of visual or you've been directed to a specific part of the presentation to watch, you can click on the timestamp in the description box below that corresponds to the information you're looking for. So, for example, if you're looking for information on visual schedules, you can click the timestamp below beside visual schedules. It will bring you to a slide with some information on why we use visual schedules and a video showing you how to implement them. You may find yourself coming back to this presentation at different times as the needs of the individual changes. This presentation content is relevant for autistic individuals, people with intellectual disabilities, developmental delay and specific language difficulties. But please keep in mind that visuals should always be individualised. When referring to autism in this presentation, we use both person first language for example, a person with autism and identity first language, for example, autistic person, as we recognise that viewers may have a preferred term that they use when speaking about autism. People on the autism spectrum may have difficulties understanding verbal language. This can be due to a language disorder or in the absence of, a spe of specific language difficulties. It can be due to feeling overwhelmed, anxious or dysregulated. This is why using visuals can be relevant for many people on the autism spectrum. We practice a total communication approach. This means accepting and using lots of different means of communication, including verbal speech, body language, facial expression, sign and gesture, including love, and visual supports are a part of this approach. We hope that you find this presentation useful. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, you can get our contact details on our blog, which is linked in the description box below. Visuals or visual supports are anything that we use to show. Sometimes when we hear the word visuals, we think of small pictures that are laminated. However, visuals include many, many more things. For example, photographs, objects, sign, like love, and gestures, drawings, written words, if your young person can read, videos, calendars, social stories, comic strip conversations, and many more. Now we are going to talk about why visuals are useful. Some visuals, such as calendars, diaries and visual schedules, help us to know the plan. Being able to see the plan makes the day a bit more predictable and can have a calming effect. Imagine if you lost your calendar or your diary. Not knowing what to expect can be very stressful. It's the same for our young people. Being able to see the plan make things more, makes things more predictable and reduces uncertainty, which is often a source of stress. On this slide, there is also a picture of a visual guide with information on how to catch a connecting flight at the airport. Think about the kind of situation you might be in looking at this visual. If you're travelling, you might be tired, you might be stressed if you're late trying to catch the flight, and the airport is quite an unfamiliar environment. So all of those things could be contributing to you feeling dysregulated. If someone came up to you 
and told you the steps involved in catching this connecting flight, it probably would not be as effective as this sign in showing you these steps. This is because when we're dysregulated, we cannot process verbal information as well as we usually can. This is a really important point to remember when our young people are feeling dysregulated. If the young person is tired, stressed, sick or hungry, or if they are in a new environment, or maybe there has been a change in their day, they might be feeling dysregulated. Just like us being stressed at the airport, this then impacts their ability to process verbal information. So it is really important for us to supplement our verbal information with visuals during these times. Using visuals is really important to support our learners who have language difficulties for many reasons. By using visuals, we are allowing the young person have extra time to process and understand a message. When we are using visuals, we also tend to slow our speech down. Also, visuals don't disappear, unlike our words. So if the young person doesn't understand what we say the first time, they can go back, look at the visual and process the information at their own pace. Another reason is visuals are consistent, unlike our words. What I mean here is that visuals don't tend to change. For example, if we are using a finished card or the law of sign for finished, it always looks the same. But if we are just using words to say that an activity is finished, there are lots of things that we might say. For example, that's it, the end, next one, all done. When using visuals, we are always trying to promote independence. For some, independence might be following a visual schedule to complete a task. For others, it might be using visuals to learn a new skill, for example, getting dressed. And for others, it can be using visuals to practice planning and organisation, for example, problem solving to get themselves organised for school independently. We want to use visuals to help autistic individuals to take an active role in their lives in whatever way is appropriate given their age and developmental level. This will look different for every individual, but promoting independence is always our goal. Lastly, ticking things off a list or pulling things off a visual schedule as they're being completed gives us a sense of achievement and we can feel like we are making progress, which is very motivating. So why use visual schedules? Visual schedules can be a really important visual support in a child or young person's environment. We heard earlier how visual supports in general can help orient a child, help them know the plan and make life more predictable. Visual schedules are used for these reasons too. Visual schedules can provide information on what a child is being asked to do. They can help a child to know the plan. They can make daily life more predictable which in turn can reduce stress and uncertainty. They add structure and routine, and they can motivate. Watch the following video to get some ideas on how you can make a visual schedule and implement it. So in this video, I'm just gonna give some ideas on how you could introduce and implement a visual schedule at home or at school. So I'm just going to talk through some different types of visual schedules that you might want to make. So here's one I've just made. I laminated two plain white A4 pages and I stuck a line of Velcro down the middle. So some people like have visual schedules that work left to right. So I've chosen to work vertically here. So I have my schedule. You could put the child or young person's name on the top. Um, and I just taped a plastic envelope to the bottom with our visual symbol for finished, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. So 
what I will do with this visual schedule is I will have my pictures for different activities and I will have this pre-prepared. So you might have things like go to the bathroom, brush teeth, get dressed, breakfast. So these might be something that kind of always happen the same. And then you might have choices of different types of activities. So you might have a set list of activities already decided or you might have a choice board like this where you're saying, okay, what do we do after breakfast? Maybe some soccer, um, then maybe trampoline. And after that, we might do some water play and then there's academics or a homework packet. And you can plot out your day like this. So it obviously depends on the child. You might have some children whose visual schedules might be quite short and you might have four main things on. Others, you can plot out the full day, you know, moving to kind of dinner, bedtime, etc. This is an example of a visual schedule that uses pictures and has the words on as well. If you don't have the visuals or access to the visuals, you can also have a whiteboard, a blackboard, I have a laminated A4 sheet, and here I've just written play outside and a little drawing to go with it. For children who are literate and don't need the little pictures beside, you can have a written schedule with just the activities and um, some check boxes here. So now we're going to see how we could use the schedule. So what I've done is I've hung the visual schedule in the kitchen. This can be placed in a, in a location that is can be easily accessed, that you're passing a lot, that you can, you know, it can also come with you. So if you, you can bring the schedule with you, you know, to the garden or you could bring it to the sitting room um, and around the house or around the classroom as well. So I have it come here and the idea is that as tasks are completed, you or the child should take the activity and you can say it's finished and that will go in the finished envelope okay and this sign for finish it's visual and it always means finished okay so the child or young person will get used to seeing that the task is finished and it's put away this is a way to see what's next so the child can be shown oh next we get dressed and because these have been taken away the child can get used to checking it and understanding oh that's finished, next is this. So the idea is, as tasks are completed, they're put into the finished envelope and the attention is drawn to what's next. If you have a written schedule, like the one I showed you, um, you might have tick boxes. So what you can do in this case is you can either tick that it's finished or you could cross it out. And that helps the child if they come back to the, the schedule to see that that is finished and that's what's next. So that might give you some ideas for making your own visual schedule. One thing that we did mention earlier is consistency. So for example, this is the symbol or picture that we are choosing to use for breakfast. So this will be used for breakfast no matter what we're having for breakfast. So breakfast might change, but the symbol stays consistent. And that's really important to help a child understand that this is representing breakfast. Um, this represents trampoline. This is water playing, even if the toys you're using are different. And that just helps the child. The more consistent we are, the better a, uh, a child is able to learn and um, you know knows what to expect. So I hope that was helpful and has given you some ideas about how you could implement visuals in your home environment or school environment. I'm now going to briefly talk about a first and then board. A first and then board is another type of visual schedule. Like the other visual schedules that we've looked at, a first and then board lets a child know the plan, but uses less symbols and focuses specifically on two activities what we are doing first and then after. For example, it could be used for activities that we do every day. 
first we get dressed then brush our teeth it should also be used for academic work first we're going to do our numbers then we're going to do our worksheet can also be used for other activities first we are painting and then we're going on the trampoline so we're only using two symbols first and then if you don't have a first and then board made up you can always grab a white page like this or a whiteboard if you have one draw a line down the middle and we can write the words first painting then trampoline just like with our other schedules when the first activity is finished if we have a drawn first and then board or on a whiteboard we can say painting is finished now trampoline if we have a laminated one when the first activity is finished we can say painting is finished we can pop that in our finished envelope now trampoline you might use a first and then board if your child or a child you are working with has not experienced schedules before and they are struggling with the concept it's not necessary to start with a first and then board but it can be a good visual to explicitly teach the concept of first and then and of activities happening in a sequence we can use visual supports for helping with transitions a transition is a change from one activity to another and autistic children and young people can sometimes struggle with this. There is a few things that we can do. We can give a verbal and visual reminder that an activity is coming to an end. For example, we can say verbally two minutes left in that activity and we could use an egg timer to show how much time is left in an activity. For example, you can get egg timers that visually represent one, two, five minutes and it's an extra reminder for the child of how much time is left in the activity. A timer on a phone or iPad works as well. We can also use a transition song or melody to indicate that an activity is finishing or that another activity is starting. For example, a tidy up song when it's time to tidy up from one activity or the same song could be used consistently to show circle time is starting. We can also use a finish sign or symbol, such as the one on the slide. We can use this symbol consistently when activities are finished. We can also use a visual of the next activity. This could be a picture of the activity in question, a symbol, or even an object. For example, a wooden spoon to indicate a baking activity, or a bubble packet to show that the next activity is bubbles. Why do we need to break a task down with visuals? The main reason that we are talking about using visuals to break down the steps involved in a task is to communicate what is involved in that task to the young person. By showing them the steps involved, we are letting them know what is expected during this task and most importantly when the task will be finished which helps them to which helps facilitate attention and hopefully helps you get through the task showing an individual the steps involved in a task can also make it easier to complete independently so by showing them the steps involved, you are promoting independence. However, we'll be talking more about um, carrying out tasks independently in the following slide. Also, showing the steps involved in a task is really important in learning a new skill. Um, but this isn't the only important support we need to give when learning a new skill. So please, if you are interested in, in finding more information on how to teach new skills, check out the link below 
which is a link to videos made by our occupational therapy department on promoting independence in daily activities, um, such as getting dressed and brushing teeth. Now we're going to talk about breaking tasks down within a schedule. I have two schedules here behind me. One is a picture schedule and one is a written word schedule with some line drawings. Okay, let's have a look at this first one. The first task is breakfast, okay? So let's say we are finished breakfast, that is finished. As we saw in a previous video, that goes into the finished envelope. And the next task is getting dressed. Okay, so getting dressed is now finished as well. Excellent. Trampoline, okay, that's straightforward. Pretend we've that one done. Okay, and now we move on to schoolwork. So as you can see, I didn't have um, a laminated, nice printed card for schoolwork. So I decided to fold a post-it, draw my own little picture and stick it up. That's perfectly fine. Chances are we won't have nice laminated visuals for everything that pops up in the day or, or everything that needs to be put in the schedule. So um, having a packet of post-its and improvising is absolutely perfectly fine. So schoolwork might be a task that would be handy to break down into steps, maybe because maybe some children find might find that a little bit tricky and it's not a preferred activity. So it can be really good to break that down to show them how long the task will last. We can do this in a number of ways. Um, I have just a sheet, just a sheet here. Um, with one, two, three, four. So if I could break schoolwork down into four parts and have, just do a little box and as those parts are completed, tick them off. Or maybe I want to write what is involved in each of the four parts and tick, tick them off. Or maybe if some children love stamps, you could stamp the boxes as you go along. Um, but the, the good thing about this is the child or young person has a visual of when the task is going to end so they don't think that it's going to go on forever. Um, if you have say schoolwork broken down into four and, and if the child or young person is finding it really difficult to attend and to finish the four steps at a route about task three, um, listen to them, label those feelings, acknowledge those feelings and give them some more support to just get it finished nice and quickly um, and then to achieve to ensure they achieve success and get used to using this kind of a breakdown and then maybe the next time you might think of reducing the tasks involved in schoolwork to just three so this is one way to show um how long a task will be and to show what is involved in a task you could also use items around the house to show how long a task will will last so i saw a colleague use this recently um just having four pegs stuck in a box and this is the visual representation of how long the task will last so when each of the four pegs are in the box the task is over similarly you could if you wanted to include um, a, a little bit of movement in the task maybe you could have the child roll over a yoga ball to put something in a container and when the container is full, the, the activity is finished. Whatever works for your child. There are lots of different ways to break a task down and show the end point. So when each thing is ticked or stamped or all the pegs are in the box, that means that the task is finished. Great. The next series of videos that we are going to see will show how we can use visuals to help individuals get organised and make a plan. So in the previous video, we talked about breaking down a task. We were talking about breaking down the task of schoolwork into four steps by writing them down, showing them to the young person, and then the young person ticking them off as each part is completed. In this video, we're going to talk a little more about involving the young person in this planning part of the task, instead of just writing down the steps for them. 
I want to introduce two terms here, passive and active. In breaking down the task of schoolwork, if the young person was involved in figuring out what the four steps were, then they were active in the planning. But if, if an adult wrote down what the four parts of the schoolwork task were, then the young person was passive in the planning of this activity. In both of these scenarios, breaking down the steps and showing the young person what is involved is beneficial. For some individuals, especially those with an intellectual disability, carrying out the planning part of the tasks independently may not be the, the goal, but involving them by having a discussion around the planning is still very beneficial. If the young person is able, it's important for us to help them become act more active in the planning of a task. This will help them work towards being able to truly do a task independently. Carrying out a task truly independently involves being able to do the planning part of the task too. So this might involve breaking the task down themselves by writing their own checklist. In this video, we are going to show two examples of getting a young person active and involved in the planning part of the task. We want to support them to be able to think about the steps that need to be taken for the task to be completed instead of just writing out the steps for them. This can be thought of as future planning or a technical term that you might have heard used to describe this is executive functioning skills. This future planning requires lots of practice and there are lots of opportunities to, to practice this future planning skill in everyday activities. For example, if I needed to make a plan to pack a bag for going swimming, I would future plan by visualising myself ready to go into the pool with my hat, my goggles and my swimming tops. We often do this future planning by visualising. So a way to start practising getting the young person active in the planning part of a task is to help them visualise the steps by taking a picture of the end result that you're working towards and then going from there. For example, here is a picture of Elaine and this is a picture of her ready to go out the door to work in the morning. So this is the end result that we are working towards and planning for. She is holding her laptop bag, her lunch, her keys. So we are going to sit, I'm going to sit down with this picture with Elaine and talk about the things that we need to maybe write down on a checklist to get her to this end point, ready to go to work. As we talk through the steps involved to getting to this end result, um, I will be making Elaine active in the planning part of getting to this end result. In this case, the photo is the visual support to help Elaine figure out the steps involved. And over time, she might need this a photo of the end result less and less. Okay Lynn, so we're going to make a plan for getting ready in the morning, okay? And we want to make a plan for this end result. So I took a picture of you going to work yesterday morning and just before you went out the door, this was you ready. So we want to, to write down the steps now that we need to do to get you ready, like this picture shows. Okay. Okay, so what's the first thing that you do in the morning, Elaine? The I very first thing. get up and I get dressed. Perfect. We write get up. You can read very well, so I'm not going to draw any pictures. Okay, so get up, get dressed. Okay. After you get dressed, Elaine, what, what do you do then? Um, get my bags. 
Mm, yep, you're right. You do get your bags, absolutely. And they'll be down here. But what do you do? Maybe have a think before that. So you come downstairs and you come into the kitchen and then I give you something. Oh, I have my breakfast. This is your breakfast, exactly. Then what do you do after you have your breakfast, Celine? Um, I get my bags and my lunch. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What about if there are some cornflakes stuck in your teeth? To have a think in the morning, usually after breakfast, you go back upstairs to do something. Oh yeah, I brush my teeth and brush my hair. Brush teeth, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, in this picture, your hair is nice and brushed. Brush teeth. And you brush your hair. And then, like you were saying, you get your bags. So what bags do we need? Um, my laptop bag Excellent. and my handbag. Okay, so I'll just write those down. Laptop bag, handbag. Is there anything else that you need? Um, my lunch. Your lunch, yeah, just remember that. Great. And how, or what about if it's cold outside or it's raining? Oh yeah, I need my coat yeah. and maybe my umbrella. Coat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Umbrella. And how do you get to work? I go in the car. Yeah. So what are you going to need? My keys. Mm -hmm. That's great. So tomorrow morning, I'm going to stick this list up in the hall and you can take it and you can tick the things off as you do them. Um, and when you're finished all of these, you'll be ready to go out the door to work. Another example might be packing a bag for hurling match. You could use a picture of the young person playing hurling, like this one, and use it to plan, to help them plan what they will need. So when sitting down and looking at this picture together, like we did previously with Elaine, have a discussion about the things that they will need to bring. For example, helmet, shorts, jersey, boots. Also, you could model out loud all of the other factors that you are thinking about and that you want the young person to consider um, when packing their bag. For example, the weather. As well as being able to plan and organise yourself to have all of the items that you need, future planning skills also involve thinking about time and getting things done in a certain time frame. If you feel your young person is able, start talking about time when planning. For example, if the match was on at six o'clock, you'd be thinking, how long, will it time to, how long will it take to get there? How busy will traffic be? Um, what time do we need to be there for? So you can help your young person to develop these future planning skills and include time in them by having these discussions, again, out loud, showing them how you problem solve, how you figure out the time element. Maybe you're using Google Maps and involving them in it. Okay, so we're gonna make a plan now for your match later. And we're gonna use this picture of you um, playing hurling to try and plan what you need to pack to bring to the match, okay? okay? So if you write down your bag there and we'll have a think about all the things that you need to bring. Okay. Right, you can use that picture to help you then. There's, good, there's loads of My hurling. clues. My helmet. Jersey. Uh, shorts and boots. Yeah, you'll need all those things, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, yeah. Okay, and do you think, will it be raining? I don't know. Right, how could we find that out? Would you check check on your phone there, check your app, your weather app?
It'll be raining. Yeah, it's raining. It is. Okay, so if it's raining, so it's probably going to be pretty wet and muddy. Is there anything else that you need to pack, do you think? Um, a towel. A towel, yeah, definitely. Your boots are probably going to be destroyed from the mud. They'll um, probably destroy, they could destroy all the stuff in your bag. How would you my boot bag? Yeah, your boot bag, definitely, to keep them separate. Mm hmm Great. And it's going to be, it's going to be a tough game. I'd say you'll be very thirsty. So is there anything else you need to pack in that, in your bag? What do you usually bring? Bring a drink or Luke's Aid. Luke's Aid, yeah. yeah. It gives you energy, doesn't it, before a match? Yeah. Okay, that's great. So there are all the things that you need. So when you're packing your bag in a minute, you can bring that checklist with you or all of or that that di that um spider diagram with you to make sure that you put all the things you need in the bag. Um, and what time do you so it's on a Nemo Rangers. So do you want to write Nemo Rangers down, down here at the bottom? Mate? Oh, yeah, are there? Perfect. Um, and what time do you need to be there? Um. Do you know? Do you remember? No. No. So how would you find out now? Someone texted you, didn't yeah, they? Yeah. Your yeah, your coach texted you. So have a look look up that text and we'll see what time do you need to be there for. The match is on at six. Match is on at six. You have to be there fifteen minutes before. Right, so you need to be there for five forty five, yeah, or quarter to six. Okay. Right. And we're going from home. So how long does it take to get to Nemo Rangers from here? Um can I look it up? Yeah, Google Maps. You know how to use Google Maps. Yeah, so you just enter home and then Nemo Rangers. And look up directions and it'll tell you the time. Google Maps says it takes 15 minutes. It takes 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Granted, you want to write 15 minutes? Lovely. Um, right, and I'm just thinking now, last time... We went from home, do you want to write home down here? Yeah. Last time we went to Nemo Rangers pitch, it was around the same time and traffic was really busy because we had to go through the city. So I think you'll need at least another, add another 15 minutes for us to be, to add to the journey because um, the traffic will be heavy. So, okay. Okay, so can you figure out from that what time we need to leave home at? Um... If we need to be there for 5.45 and it's, we're going to give ourselves about 30 minutes to get there. Uh, quarter past five. Yeah. So 5.15. 5 15. So we're going to leave at about 5.15. Perfect. So do you want to maybe put a reminder in your phone? Yeah. For maybe 5.10 that, that, you know, that we're leaving in five minutes and make sure that you've got all the things you need. I'm now going to speak a little bit about introducing and preparing for change. So why prepare for change? Well, unexpected changes can happen every day, and this can be difficult for all of us. Some autistic people can find change particularly difficult. It's for this reason that we can help prepare for change so that a child or young person can better cope when unexpected changes occur. There's some general things that we can do to help deal with change. We can allow time for a child to process change. We can validate the child or young person's feelings about change. Change can be uncomfortable and frustrating. And what we can do is label the emotions as the child is feeling them and accept that it's difficult. We can describe the change using clear and concrete language. We can also create positive associations with change. You can watch the following video to get some ideas on how you can prepare for change and create positive associations with change. So we've spoken about visual schedules and how to implement them and how we can plot out our plan for the day in the morning. So every day will vary slightly, even if we have many of the same activities, no two days are identical. For example, you might have an extracurricular activity scheduled once a week, you might have homework on your schedule Monday to Thursday and then none from Friday up to the weekend. Um, and you might garden on Wednesday and not do it again for another few days. So there will be natural change built into your schedule day to day. But even with the best of intentions, unexpected changes can happen. 
So for example, a trip to the park may have to be postponed because of bad weather or an extracurricular class may have been cancelled. And these are not things that you've accounted for on your schedule, of course, because they've just cropped up. So we want to help our language learners prepare for change and to develop the skills to cope with change. So when a child with autism is comfortable and understands a visual schedule, we can build in opportunities to teach about change. So as we've learned throughout this presentation, it's so important to use visuals to help children with autism learn. Now, introducing the concept of change, it's really important that we lend a visual aspect to it. So there's so many visuals out there that you could use to introduce this concept. So people might like to use a surprise card. So for the purpose of today, I'm going to use a change card. So it's just a simple white card with a black circle and the word change written on it. And this is one of the core symbols in our organisation. So no matter what symbol you use to introduce change, the important thing is that you keep it consistent and use it across all changes. So it's helpful to introduce change in a positive manner. We can do this by first changing activities that are seen as non-preferred, in other words, not their favourite activities, to activities that are preferred or their favourite activities. So we're going to demonstrate this. So for example, this could be a schedule for a little boy who doesn't really like sit down academic work at the table, but really loves playing outside, running around the garden and being outside in the fresh air. So what we can do is we can go through the schedule and introduce the change cards and say, oh, today we're going to have breakfast, get dressed, do the dishes, brush the teeth. Oh, and there's going to be a change there. We're not going to do our worksheet. We're going to play outside. Then we're going to go on the trampoline, do the laundry and water. And then we can go about our day as usual, putting the finished activities into the finished folder. And when we get here, we're going to play outside instead of doing our worksheets. There will be times when you might just find out right before the activity that there's going to be a change. And the same thing will apply. You'll still put on the change card and put the replacement activity on it. So this was how to tackle a change in your plan for the day on a pre-planned day. For larger life changes that you know are upcoming, for example, a transition to a different school, a new baby, or moving house, you could use a social story to help your child prepare for that. In the final slide on this presentation, there is a link to further information on social stories, how to write them and how to implement them. So now I am going to speak a little bit about calendars and how we can use them as a visual support in a child or young person's environment. We all use calendars to help us plan our time and to orient ourselves, be it with desk calendars, wall planners, diaries or online calendars. Time is an abstract concept. Our language is built on time-related concepts and words, but this can be confusing. Saying something will happen tomorrow or at the weekend, what does that mean? Calendars can help us explain these things. They can help orient a child, to prepare for change, to plan and to promote independence. You may need to support your child with using a calendar, but may find that in time they become more independent in using them. Calendars can be weekly or monthly. Blank monthly templates can be found online and they can be printed and filled in. Calendars let your child know the plan. Important events or things that happen every week can be plotted onto a calendar. For example, swimming every Tuesday. Calendars can help prepare for a change of routine. They can help a child prepare for school holidays or the return to school. Calendars can be used to mark and plan for special occasions, like birthdays. This can be really motivating for a child to plot out whose birthdays are happening in the next month, Mother's Day, etc. The bonus of using calendars is that they can help a child learn about this concept of time, the days of the week, the months of the year, weekdays versus weekends. They can also be a really good focus for conversation. They can prompt discussion about something that happened maybe last week or an upcoming event that they're excited about. And it gives you a shared topic of conversation. Click on the video in the next slide for a demonstration on how you could use a calendar. 
So now I'm just going to demonstrate how you could use a calendar at home. So you can of course use any calendar that you have at home, a desk calendar or a wall calendar, but you can also access blank templates such as these online. And these are nice because they have space in which to write events or stick symbols in if you want. You can laminate your calendar if you want and use a washable marker, which you can write on the calendar with and rub off if things change. Or you can also use them in paper form like this. So I'll leave a link in the description box of the video with a link to these calendar templates. So one thing you can do with a calendar is differentiate between weekdays and weekends. So you could do this using a different colour, maybe for weekend days. Or you could get a no school symbol and stick it into every Saturday and Sunday, just so that there's a clear difference between the days of the week and the weekend. Another thing you can do is mark in motivating events such as birthdays and extracurricular activities. So here we could put in Jake's birthday and here we could put swimming. You can also mark in times of transition, summer, Easter, Christmas holidays and the day that a child is going back to school so that you can prepare in the weeks coming up. So we can put in back to school and count down the days just to prepare for that transition back. It's also really important to cross out the days as you go to show the passing of time. You can pick a time of the day, maybe at the end of the day before bed, where you can look at the calendar with your child and cross out that day. This helps to show that time has passed, also helps teach the days of the week. And the next day it's easier for the child or young person to check what day it is, looking at the crossed out days previous. This helps a child orient themselves and over time they may be able to check this themselves. Calendars can also be very useful for children who ask about when events will take place. Some children with ASD may ask repetitively about events, even if the question has already been answered. For example, when Santa is coming or when an upcoming birthday party is happening. This could be due to looking for reassurance, wanting to know what's going to happen and when, or it could be because a child is not retaining the information. We can use a calendar when a child asks repetitively about an event. When the child asks when something is happening, we can mark it in the calendar, for example, Anne's birthday party. And we can help the child count the days until the event. So we can say, oh, look, today, this is today. So we've got one, two, three, four days until Anne's birthday party. We can do this for a while. And over time, if able, the child can be prompted to look at the calendar and count the days themselves as you reduce your cues. So those are just some of the ways that calendars can be used as a visual support in a child or young person's environment. Of course, the calendar should be individualised to the child and to the family with important events and school and extracurricular activities marked in. As we said in the introduction to our calendar section, the events in the calendar can also serve as a topic of conversation and you can talk about events that have happened, things that are upcoming, and it can serve as a shared topic of conversation. And the bonus is that we are emphasising the concept of time and the days of the week and all of those things as well. So I hope that was helpful. We know that it's really important to give individuals a choice within their day or a say in their day. We can support individuals in making these choices by using visuals because sometimes making a choice from some verbal options can be tricky. Using visuals to support choice making is also really beneficial to do at 
unstructured times like free time or time on the yard because choices available are shown. So now we are going to talk about using visuals to support choice making. It's really important to include choices in a young person or a child's day. And there's lots of ways that we can do this. So there is a, um, an information sheet on our website um, with general strategies on supporting choice making. So we will link that at the end of the presentation. And right now we'll specifically talk about how visuals can be used to support and choice making. Okay, so as we've previously discussed, visuals aren't just pictures or words, they're anything we use to show, including objects. So, for example, these bowls, you could ask a child or a young person, which bowl would you like? Would you like this one or this one? So you're showing them the options. You could do the same with snacks or toys or drinks. There are also lots of ways to include choices in your visual schedule. For example, you could um, give an individual a choice as to the order of certain tasks. So would you like to get dressed or brush your teeth first? Um, and they could also make a choice as to fun activities, such as would you like to bounce on the trampoline or you know, play with your iPad? So we're going to have a look at our schedule now and as you can see what the, this activity um, that's next is play outside. So we're going to use a choice board to show what the options are for playing outside. Often with activities like this that are quite vague such as play outside or uh, free time or you know play time or or time on the yard, um, children can find it difficult because there isn't as much structure and the options available aren't as clear. So we can use a choice board to help this. So our options for play outside or some suggestions for play outside on this choice board are trampoline, dancing, obstacle course and soccer. So again, this is a really, you know, because play outside might come up every day or, you know, structure or free play at school might come up every Friday. It might be nice to, you know, print those pictures and put them on on a nice laminated choice board. But there may also be times in the day where you you identify an opportunity for your young person to make a choice and you don't have a lovely choice board. So again, just write down the options and and show them and and help support them to make a choice um, we can also use visuals like this to support individuals in making a choice um, for a plan for the weekend so my example here is saturday and it says i can and here are the options available so i can choose to stay at home go to the park or go swimming so maybe circle the choice that the young person makes and then you could pop it into their, their calendar. Visuals can be used to support a wide range of social skills. Visuals can be used to support turn taking skills or they can be used to support an individual in understanding various social situations or preparing for them, for example by using social stories and comic strip conversations. Using visuals or showing as well as saying or explaining can help an individual understand because these visuals don't disappear and they can be processed at an individual's own pace and reviewed later if necessary. This is especially important for language learners. On the next slide, we talk about visual using visuals of WH questions. These visuals can be used to teach the meaning of WH questions, to remind individuals to include main information when they're sharing news and stories, and to promote self-advocacy by teaching them how to ask these questions.
There are lots of different visuals that we can use to support social skills. For example, to support turn-taking skills, we might use a turn-taking dial like this that clearly shows whose turn it is. And we can move this. Or maybe we might use a visual of a voice thermometer that will show an individual how loud or quiet a voice is expected in certain places or situations. Um, and then, of course, social stories and comic strip conversations are visuals that we can use to support individuals in social um, situations. There are handouts um, explaining how to use both of these at the end of the presentation. Now I'm going to talk about using visuals of WH questions to support um, social skills. So I, as you can see, I have some WH questions off, stuck up on the wall here. We have who, what doing, what, where, and when. These particular um, colors and symbols are from the Colorful Semantics program. Um, again, you can use any, any pictures or symbols you like as long as you're consistent um, and again these are quite small but you could use large A4 um, symbols as well if you needed them to be a little bit bigger. Sticking them up on the wall at home or in the classroom it can be nice because we can refer to them throughout the day um, and teach individuals the meaning of WH questions and help them understand them. So for example if you have this sticking up at home and the doorbell rings, you might say, oh, who is at the door? Let's go and have a look. Or you might, maybe if you were baking, um, you might have the flour and you might refer to the visual and ask, right, where are we going to put the flour? Let's put it into the bowl. You'll notice that I'm answering my questions here because if I am... If my goal is to help and my young person understand what these questions mean, I want to teach them by giving them answers and not just testing them by asking the questions. Maybe when reading a story, you might refer to um, these questions and just to summarise the last chapter or the last part of the story as well. So um, if your young person is familiar with these visuals, um, because you've been referring to them throughout the day, they know and they have some understanding of what the questions mean. We can use the we can use these visuals to support the young person in um, sharing their news or telling a story. So you might just do this with the prompts on the wall. Um, so for example, if a young person is telling you a story but is going into uh, maybe a lot of detail and hasn't provided quite the context for the story, then you might use these visuals to remind them to include this information. So for example, um, if you were listening to a story about a video game and the young person is giving lots of details about the video game, um, you might say, oh, okay, but who, so who is playing the video game again? Oh, you and John. And where were you playing it? In John's house. And then you could summarise. So you and John were playing Mario Kart in John's house. And maybe if you had discussed when last weekend. These w visuals of WH questions can be really useful in pre-preparing news as well for school or for home. Um, so I've got some examples of news sheets here that, um, that we have used in the past. Okay, let's look at this one. So this has the prompts um, of the WH questions here. So and your young person might fill this in or you might. And then maybe it could go in their home school communication book into school. And the important thing is the teacher or whoever is listening to the news has the information in front of them and can then support the young person in sharing as much of that news as they can. That's one variety. Um, this is another type of news sheet that, that um, we have used. So maybe a photograph of the news that is being shared could, could go here. Um, and maybe just visual prompts to include these elements are needed in this case and not necessarily written information. Or here's another type, maybe and the young person, if they like drawing, they could draw their news out here and then map the 
um, WH questions or map this information onto their news. When sharing news, remember the key elements are who, what, or what doing, and where. And once that information is is included in the story or in news, then um, context is provided, and it's and it's a pretty sound story. Another way to use um, visuals for WH questions is to help a child advocate for themselves by asking these questions to get the information that they need. We've spoken throughout this presentation about how making things predictable and knowing the plan can be comforting because it, it can reduce uncertainty and stress. These visuals can be um, placed in a young person environment and they can be used throughout the day to remind them or prompt them to ask for information that they need um, or if they're not there yet they can be used by communication partners to model questions to get the information that they need. If a young person at school likes to know who they are working with throughout the day um, they could be taught to ask that question and to advocate for that information for themselves. Um, maybe the this question cue card or this who visual could be on their desk and and their communication partner could model who who is working with me now. Similarly, if an individual is leaving the classroom or leaving the house and they don't know where they are going, um, they could be prompted to ask where by pointing to this or asking a question or their communication partner again could model the question. Um, so they they might model where are we going and then maybe show them by maybe using a picture on their phone or showing them a first next board or something like that. If an individual is finished a task, we might prompt them to ask what's next and then check their schedule. So maybe and maybe if um, your young person is, you know, repeating maybe a phrase about an event, an upcoming event, and you're interpreting, okay, they're asking me when that event is, maybe they're repeating a phrase about a birthday party, and, and you know they're asking when is their birthday party, you could use it in that instance and model the question, when is my birthday party? It's important for communication partners to recognise when a young person is looking for information, and then model how they can get that information independently, and support that with these visuals. As we touched on at the beginning of this presentation, we all use visuals in our daily lives and they help all of us. So no, you can't be too old to use visuals. Over time, however, you might look at making visuals more sophisticated and age appropriate. For example, reducing them in size, or perhaps introducing a diary instead of using a visual schedule, or using the calendar app on your phone. There are lots of apps available and functions on a phone that, that can support us in a visual way. For example, the timer or the stopwatch, the calendar, the notes app, just to name a few. Or another sophisticated use of visuals might be using a colour coding system for schoolwork or for homework. Remember that if visual supports are in place and working well for a young person, the goal is not to remove these visual supports. It's likely that they are in fact contributing to the success and taking them away would be unfair. Like we previously mentioned, in time, if it's appropriate, they can be made a little bit more sophisticated, but it's important that the young person is involved in the planning of any changes that are made and that they're encouraged to take ownership over their visuals. Yes, as well as supporting communication skills, visuals also support emotional regulation. As we discussed in previous slides, visuals can fill in information gaps 
and make things more predictable. When things are more predictable, it can help with emotional regulation. It is important to remember that if we are feeling stressed or dysregulated for any reason, we may not be able to process information as clearly as we might in a more regulated state. This is the same for autistic individuals and means that when dysregulated, they may not have access to their usual communication skills. We know that many people with autism experience emotional and sensory dysregulation often. This is for a number of reasons that may include having communication difficulties, sensory processing differences, problems in social understanding, and sometimes medical issues. This means that individuals who, who have good communication skills may become dysregulated a number of times in a day and experience not being able to access these communication skills to the same level. Of course, this varies, but it is something to be especially aware of during times of transition. For example, having a new school or teacher, going to a new school or having a new teacher during periods of illness and having positive and negative emotional experiences. It is important to introduce visual supports when an, in, an individual is regulated, so they are then familiar with them for these times when they need them. Also, remember that even in a regulated state with excellent communication skills, visuals can help planning, organizing, breaking tasks down, and understanding, especially understanding social situations. This flowchart illustrates how important visuals are when words are not available in times when someone might be feeling dysregulated. You have listened to a lot of information since the start of this presentation on visual supports and we want to summarise some key points in a take home message for you. You can revisit this video presentation at any point if you need to refresh on certain videos or you need to look at more information on specific types of visual supports. But if you go away from this presentation with these take home messages, it's really valuable. So we want you to think about how you can show what you are saying and to remember that visuals are anything that we use to show. They can of course be those pre-prepared laminated visuals, but a photo on a phone, a drawing on a post-it, these are all visuals. So think about how you can show what you are saying throughout your day using what you have to hand. Visuals can make day-to-day -day activities more predictable and therefore less stressful. So think about how you can incorporate them into your day-to-day -day activities. Visuals can support an individual to understand information better and to express themselves. Visuals can support participation. Visuals can be used to support the development of planning and organization skills. And most importantly, it's so important to make using visuals a positive experience. So think about how you can incorporate them Think of the things you have to hand and how you can use them and think about how it's important that the children and young people see you using visuals as well and that will all help make it a positive experience.